Thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a delight to see so many people here, and let me uh, get started. We'll, uh, John and I will each talk for roughly 20 minutes or so, and then we'll have about 35 minutes for questions. So if you have questions, uh, write them down. Uh, some of the old guys in the room, like Wayne, you may want to write them down because you'll forget them in the 40 minutes. So, uh, any rate, so let me get started. In the middle of June, I visited the West Bank. I was coming from a 10-day vacation in Greece and was not at all prepared for what I found. Today, I'll share with you two stories. One, about my experience being in the West Bank, and the other, about the amazing businesses that have been able to survive there in spite of the occupation. The purpose of my week-long trip was to familiarize myself with the Palestinian business community. I'm in the process of creating a nonprofit organization to build economic bridges between Palestinians and Americans. My co-founder, Sam Bahauer, grew up in America but is now a Palestinian who has lived and worked in the West Bank for nearly 20 years. The plan was for me to meet with more than 20 businesses and related organizations in Ramallah and in several other communities in the West Bank. I was to stay in Albira, a suburb of Ramallah, only a few blocks from Sam's home. The hotel st I stayed, uh, I thought the name of it was Aladdin, and when I told the taxi driver uh, I wanted to go to Aladdin, he said, I've never heard of Aladdin, and I spelled it for him, and he said, ah, Aladdin. <laughs> so I was able to get to the hotel. I was a little nervous for a while. When I met Sam for dinner on Sunday night, he said, things are tense. He described the three Israeli teenagers that had disappeared near Hebron the previous Thursday night. Without any apparent evidence, Israel was charging Hamas with the disappearance. Sam was apprehensive that this Hamas charge might become the pretext for Israel to initiate aggressive military action against Palestinians. Monday morning, Suleiman, my guide, translator, and driver, picked me up to start the week. He was a great host because, in addition to his fluent English, Solomon's East Jerusalem Palestinian status allowed him to move around the West Bank and into East Jerusalem without waiting in the long lines that most Palestinians experience. He added to the schedule companies that he had helped fund when he worked with USAID, and he also booked meetings with childhood friends who now run growing businesses. On Monday uh, at dinner, Sam told me that Israeli military vehicles and Israeli soldiers had been on his street in the early hours of the morning. That night, Monday night, at about 2.30 a.m., I abruptly awoke. I got up and I looked out the window. If you note, at the back, there's a building. That building is on the street that is right behind the hotel. Four small white cars with flashing lights appeared, traveling very close together. Who is in these cars, I wondered. They are quite obvious with their flashing lights. They're not trying to sneak around. After the cars stopped, figures emerged that were obviously soldiers, not policemen. I pulled the drapes together, stepped back, since I feared that soldiers might not like me observing them, even from the third floor. Since this area is normally secured by the police of the Palestinian Authority, I was surprised to see Israeli military. At dinner on Tuesday, I learned that Sam and his daughter had counted at least six Israeli military armored vehicles on the street in front of his house. As for those small white cars, I learned that they probably belonged to Israeli military intelligence. In past invasions, when Israeli military vehicles had entered Area A, Israeli soldiers seized Palestinians and then delivered them to Israeli intelligence in the little white cars. 
The white cars took them off to detention and interrogation. I may have witnessed this happening again outside my hotel window. It's helpful to know a little history about Oslo II Accord, which was signed nearly 20 years ago. It divided the West Bank into three areas. Ramallah and its suburbs are in Area A. Under the agreement, Area A, which is about 3%, that's the single digit 3% of the West Bank, is fully under civil and security control by the Palestinian Authority. Area A was supposed to expand progressively as additional parts of the West Bank were turned over to Palestinian control, but that never happened. Area A is the only part of the West Bank that is not controlled by Israeli military. And as you notice from the sign, entry into Area A is forbidden to all Israeli citizens. The Israeli military invaded Ramallah every night of my visit. In the middle of the week, Sam informed me that the Israeli military had even gone into the center of Birzeit University. They broke into buildings, destroyed property, and drove off with a collection of Hamas flags. Sam reported that the Birzeit leaders were stunned and shocked because the Israeli, Israeli military had never before invaded the center of the campus. Prior to this, freedom of speech at the universities had generally been respected. The other part of the story relates to freedom of movement. I had an appointment with businesses in Hebron, a major Palestinian business center, which you'll hear more about from Pastor John. However, Israeli officials had closed all entry to and exit from Hebron checkpoints following the abductions of the three Israeli teenagers. My visits had to be canceled. A visit to Nablus was also canceled by closures. Sam was unable to join us in Jerusalem or Bethlehem because his Palestinian ID would have required us to go through the normally congested Kalandia checkpoint. Because of the tightened security, this checkpoint would have added hours to our trip. After waiting for several hours, Sam might have been detained and not permitted to exit, even with a permit. Since my handler had East Jerusalem status, he was permitted to move freely through a different checkpoint unless a soldier requested us to stop. Operation Brothers Keeper was initiated on the pretext that Hamas was responsible for abducting the three Israeli teenagers. The aggressiveness of the operation was justified on the pretext that the three teenagers might still be found alive. Yet, there is credible evidence that not only was Hamas not responsible for the abductions, the Israeli government knew all along that the three teenagers had been shot within the first few hours after the abduction. When I returned to the United States, I found none of this in America's mainstream media. Neither the Israeli military invasions into several A cities in the West Bank, nor its incursions into five Palestinian universities, both as part of Operation Brother, Brothers Keeper, who knew that by the time I departed Israel on Sunday, June 22, five Palestinians had been killed, dozens had been injured, more than 1,000 homes had been invaded, and more than 360 Palestinians had been imprisoned, many without charges. It is incomprehensible to me that neither the mainstream media nor the U.S. government or the Palestinian Authority, for that matter, did anything to investigate and hold Israeli officials accountable for misleading their own people, Americans, and the entire world. That was my experience in the West Bank. Now what I'd like to do is uh, talk to you a little bit about some of these amazing Palestinian businesses, in spite of all this going on, that I was able to visit during the time that uh, I was there. This is something familiar to most of you, Coca-Cola. There is a distribution center in Ramallah. 
As you can see, they're also building things, a hole in the ground with uh, lots of work for a major new, this is a building that's under construction. This is an office building. It houses uh, PAL Trade, an organization that does research and policy formation about economic development in the Palestinian territories, and that was one of the places that we visited. The man with the hat in December of 2007, his name is Nasser Abu Farah, I probably screwed that up, but he received a special award, I don't see anybody here from AFSC, but he received a special award at the annual gathering of the American Friends Service Committee Middle East program, which they have about every year. He now runs a state-of-the-art facility that processes olive oil, almonds, and other Palestinian delicacies. Whole Foods recently launched Canaan's Jerusalem blend olive oil throughout the United States. At your local Chicago area Whole Foods store, you may find a different label, but it will have Canaan fair trade on it. For some of us, that's Canaan fair trade, not Canaan. <laughs> uh, Nasser relies on family farms with fewer than 25 acres to supply him olives. He works with farmer and women's cooperatives to support high quality and high sustainability. Not a bad track record for a 50-year-old with a PhD in cultural anthropology and international development from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a native Palestinian. This is the Convention Palace in Bethlehem. And I have talked with many of my colleagues who have been to Bethlehem since 2010 when it was open. Nobody ever heard of it. Convention Palace in Bethlehem is a world-class, state-of-the-art auditorium that seats 1,800 people. The facility has a site nearby that's connected with antiquity, the Solomon Pools. The construction and primary funding came from Consolidated Contractors Company, one of the world's largest construction companies in the Middle East and among the top 20 in the world. With 4,000 hotel rooms, four new high-end hotels in the past few years, with eight to be opened in the coming quarters, Bethlehem is a remarkable location for conventions, meetings, conferences, exhibitions, and other events. Yeah, this is a Peugeot dealership. Actually, it's a Peugeot and Citroen uh, dealership. And this man uh, had the Peugeot dealership, and he wanted to get a Citroen uh, dealership. And uh, the Israelis said they'd be happy for him to take a sub-dealership from them but he didn't want to do that. He waited five years and he finally got a dealership, so now he has both of them. But as you can see, uh, this, is a, this is, a, it's a real car dealer. They fix things the whole bit. This woman, I hesitate to pronounce the name, I'll screw it up, but it's sort of Al Hanana Un A, something like that. Anyhow, this woman, uh, USAID helped her purchase uh, this, some of the sewing machines in her organization. And she has had this sewing company for 28 years. And now, you can see what this is, chocolate candy. The family owned a, no, unfortunately, I ate it all most, mostly before I got home. Uh, the, the family owned company has a state of the art facility. And again, USAID helped the family buy equipment. Much of their chocolate pieces are hand wrapped in very attractive ways. They manufacture a huge variety of chocolate candies at several different price levels. They provided samples to us, and without a doubt, they were the tastiest chocolates I've ever eaten. All of their production is sold locally, with over 50% sold during Ramadan. And this is Rawabi. Rawabi is a world-class planned community with many structures taking form. 
The planned community will include schools, offices, parks, shopping malls, entertainment, and anything else needed. People who want to buy property can customize their units with a range of options. Financing from three different Palestinian banks is now available on site. Over 50% of the model apartments are within the buying range of middle class Palestinians. Although the planned community has received significant criticism, it is a reality that Palestinians building Palestinian housing for Palestinian families is a constructive, positive contribution to a vibrant Palestinian economy. Many of you know about Reverend Dr. Mitri Rahib. In the mid-1990s, he was simply pastor of Christmas Lutheran Church in Bethlehem. His entrepreneurial activity has now created the Dyar Consortium that is the third largest employer in Bethlehem. The Presbyterian Foundation funded a loan uh, this past year of over a million dollars to complete a building program, some of what you saw in that previous slide, for what is now called Dar al Kalima University College of Arts and Culture. And finally, another, he's a Lutheran by the way, uh, the Lutheran World Federation in Jerusalem has what they call the vocational training program. The, this program has been providing uh, vocational training to Palestinian youth since 1949. And on-site boarding is now available for those who are unable to access the school easily because of the separation wall, military checkpoints, and other constraints. I was in, invited, let me just run through quickly here. They have a culinary institute and they are actually training housewives to do uh, catering uh, so that in their spare time they can, they can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a ceramics uh, operation. Here are some of the ceramics they have created. Uh, they also have a heating and air conditioning training program, so heating and air conditioning. This is plumbing, could probably figured that one out. Uh, autom automobile mechanics is one of the uh, uh, training programs they've had from the beginning and uh, as you can see uh, they also have a room full of motors of one sort or another uh, and this is a metalworking uh, operation uh, that is a training for apprentices as well and this is a carpentry uh, apprentice training program. I was invited to the graduation ceremonies in Ramallah on my last day in the West Bank. Unfortunately, an important meeting was rescheduled so that I was unable to attend the graduation ceremonies. But I want to emphasize that in addition to providing the skills to earn a living for themselves, many small businesses have been created by graduates of this program at the uh, Lutheran uh, World uh, Federation in Jerusalem. And I join uh, Lutherans from around the world and sing praises of how the LWF Jerusalem is helping to build a vibrant Palestinian economy.